Yeah, it's, it's reflexive whether a state can tax itself. It's a very interesting question that Tom Yamachika brings up, and uh, he is our regular contributor, co-host on uh, Talking Tax with Tom, Tom Yamachika. Let's, let's move right along here. Um, what is this with uh, tax, uh, the state taxing itself? How does that work? Well, okay, here, here's, here's the deal. Uh, in this past legislative session, uh, lawmakers passed um, uh, Senate Bill 3201. And what that would have done is it would have changed the, you know, the kinds of activities that are taxable for, for nonprofits, okay? Uh, for, for most of the, uh, most of the country and for income tax purposes, the Internal Revenue Code tells us that nonprofits are normally, uh, tax exempt. I mean, if you get, if you get the, uh, the proper tax exempt classification, uh, you're exempt on almost all of your activities, except those that constitute what we call an unrelated trade or business. And what that means is it's got to be a business activity, not just a one-off, but regularly carried on. And it, it needs to be unrelated to the purpose for which uh, your uh, organization was granted a tax exemption. So uh, for example, uh, if, you have a, if you have a school, you charge tuition, uh, you can say, yeah, the, 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 the tuition is a business, but it's related to the, uh, the exemption that the, uh, that the organization has. I mean, it's, it's a school, uh, getting students educated is, you know, their, their, their tax exempt purpose. So it's related and therefore not taxable. Hmm. Now in, in Hawaii, GET goes by a different set of rules. And we tax nonprofits uh, if they have any activity, the primary purpose of which is to produce income, okay, related or not. Um, but that doesn't include fundraising, though. It does. That's, I mean, that's the point. If somebody, if somebody gives me $10, to help support my nonprofit <laughs> fund drive. That's that's a donation, and they can and they can uh, you know they, they can get a deduction for tax purposes. You're exempt for GE purposes, except if you give that person something back, like right. a ticket, like a ticket to a, a dinner. Um, in in that case, it becomes a fundraising activity, not related to the. Uh, the nonprofit's purpose, and it's a hundred percent taxable. Okay, so uh, I mean, as as if, as if it were a regular business, um, right? Which, so, um, so, so the bill would have changed it so that the nonprofit would be taxable for GE purposes only on uh, unrelated business activity as well, uh, with with some exceptions, but. I mean, it would it would have been a, a great step forward uh, for nonprofits who have been struggling with this dichotomy for you know years, if not decades. Uh, let me okay. Let me go back for a minute. So your this is uh, thirty two oh one is about for sex size tax. It's not about income tax, right? It doesn't affect uh, you, income you, tax. You started at all. out with discussing the the, the federal system uh, and unrelated business income in the federal system. Um, this does not affect unrelated business income or state income tax, right? That's correct. It's, it's the same standard. Same standard. Um, but let me go back to that for a minute. Um, so if you have unrelated business income, e either in the federal or the state, does that jeopardize your exemption from tax? Uh, it does if you make too much. Um, because how much, uh, how much is too much time? Well, if it's the primary purpose of your organization, uh, then you're not entitled to exemption. But yeah, that's pretty, but, but that's that's pretty, that's, that's pretty much it? the yeah it, it's it's subjective, and uh, it's it's kind of the you know the atomic bomb that the IRS can drop on an organization that it feels uh, you know makes too much money, 
and and they've tried that with like uh, you know the mega churches and some some other organizations like EST for example. I don't know if you remember EST, but um, that that yeah. that's those are organizations that come to mind. But I, I am I am aware of uh, educational institutions that own and operate business businesses, uh, oh, like yes. regular businesses. And that doesn't actually disqualify them from their 501c3 or whatever it is. Um, yeah, yeah. as long as the businesses are put in for-profit entities. I mean, the for-profit entities are there to make a profit. I mean, that's fine. Right, okay. Yeah. So that, that would be taxable both federal and state. Now let's move to the gross excise tax. <clears throat> before, it sounds like, before this bill came up or would have passed, it didn't, but... Uh, if you if you uh, had um, an event, say, and you charged people and you gave them food and all this, then th the theoretically um, you you would have to pay gross excise on the uh, admission fee. Yeah, is, the is gross that, ticket price. The gross ticket price. It doesn't okay. matter what the food cost. And so now this bill would have changed that. Can you can you give us the dimensions of the bill? I mean, what 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 would it have done? And then we'll examine, you know, why it was introduced. Well, okay, let's say somebody um, gives a fundraising party at the end of the year, like let's say Think Tech, and and a donor comes in and says, "Oh, hey, um, I want to be a major sponsor of the event, uh, so I'll, I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars, but give me ten tickets, so I can so I can put some people there at the celebration for you." Under the GE tax law, as it's currently worded, one hundred thousand dollars is subject to tax. Mm. You don't get any deduction whatsoever, even though it looks like a do, uh, most mostly a donation. So same same situation, same scenario, hundred thousand dollars, but n no free tickets. Yeah, if the if the donor gets nothing in exchange, then there's a different exemption that kicks in and says it's a donation. Donations aren't, aren't aren't income and not subject mm -hmm. to tax. Yeah, so a donor is always want to. A donor is going to want, and donee for that matter, is going to want to make it clear that there's no consideration passing back to the donor. Yeah, and, yeah, that that's current law. That that's not changed by this bill, but but it's it's those situations where you have like a ticket price that's disproportionate to the you know what the donor gets back in return, th those are the things that would be changed. Right now, okay. it really doesn't matter uh, what the uh, donor gets back for, you know, gets in return for the ticket, as long as it's, as long as it's something, then, then it's not a donation. Okay, that, that, that could be very unfair in the sense that, would you say 10 tickets for $100,000 would make the whole thing subject to tax, um, even under well under existing law. Um, that that just seems inequitable, doesn't it? Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why this bill was introduced. Now, uh, as it went through the legislative process, okay, um, everybody everybody kind of thought it was a good idea. Legislators thought it was a good idea. The charities thought it was a good idea. Even the department thought, mm, well, we, you know, we're, we're not going to oppose it. We're just going to, you know, give some comments on it. And, and it went all the way to the end. Okay. Then stuff happened. The, you know, the, the, the tax director who heretofore had not been kind of significantly in the loop on this, um, you took a look at it and says, what is, what is, what's going on with this thing? And that's that's when the fun started. So, can I stop you there for a minute? Where did this thing come from? I mean, it's a tax bill. Tax bills have all these technical implications. Um, it never really stands alone. It always has an implication on state revenue and uh, where it's reported elsewhere and so forth. Um, doesn't the tax office look at these bills at the time they're introduced? Doesn't the tax to. office introduce these bills? Um, doesn't the legislator who submits the bill uh, confer with the tax office to see if this is a, 
you know, legitimate, I mean, a, a positive change in some way. Yeah, they don't uh, how have to. Get, they, they don't they have don't, to at all. They don't, I guess. Yeah, they, typically, they typically don't. They wait for the, ta the tax department to testify in the bill. Okay, well, who submitted it? I guess it was not the tax office. It wasn't the tax office. All right. I mean, what, what interest group would have submitted it? The nonprofits? The nonprofits, I would imagine. Yeah. Okay, so I interrupted you. Go on, please continue. Okay, sure. So we get to the end of session, and, uh, and the uh, tax director kind of gets uh, excited over this bill because he's, he's kind of thinking, well, how, how does this sucker work? And, and then he starts getting people uh, involved for, in, in, in my own mind, spurious reasons. So, so what the bill contained was language that said that if, uh, you know, that there, are, there are some get out of free cards in the Internal Revenue Code. It says if you, you earn certain types of income, then it won't be considered uh, unrelated business taxable income, even even though it might be uh, you know, regular and continuous, like if you get rents or if you get to capital gains. Uh, th because th there are some get out of jail free cards in uh, uh, what we call 512B that say, we really don't care about the underlying business that, that got you this, this rent or this interest or capital gains. We're going to say it's not unrelated business taxable income. Okay. And for GE purposes, we didn't adopt those. So we had we had a proviso that says uh, that these five twelve B get out of jail free cards don't apply. And so somebody at the tax office kind of kind of thought about that and said, "Well, okay, that means that anything that's in the get out of get out of uh, get out of jail free um, provisions is automatically taxed, which is, which is not what it says. Okay. But, but there was an understanding that, okay, I mean, there, there are some uh, charitable organizations that do make a lo lot of money off of rents. And we have some, you know, very large land trusts, for example. Uh, and they didn't want to change that because that would distort the revenue picture. I mean, it would cost too much. And so this is this is where the the question, you know, whether the state tax itself rears, rears its ugly head. So, so the tax office then went to the University of Hawaii, and they said, "Look, in 512B, there are these get out of get out of jail free cards for research grants. This bill is going to make those taxable. Is that what you want? And of course, UH said, no, 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 we don't want that. This is okay then. Recommend veto of this bill. And uh, and they did. But it wasn't true. Yeah, I think it's not true for several reasons. Number one, governments don't pay taxes. Taxpayers pay taxes. What are, sense are, are would there be? Are you saying that the University of Hawaii is government? Yeah, it's a government. Entity. It's a government agency. Well, I think that should be, you know, a, a basic understanding of all of us. It's, it's not separate from government. The University of Hawaii is a government agency, and that has implications all across the board on so many things. Uh, what about other institutions? What about private colleges? They, they, they're they not government agencies then. That's right. They're not. Okay. Uh, but, but DOE and its public schools are, and there, and there is some guidance from the Department of Tax saying, uh, you know, and I guess they were asked about... Um, uh, fundraisers being carried on by, you know, school groups, uh, classes, PTAs, and stuff like that, and they and they said that oh, the DOE and its public schools are not considered taxable entities for GET purposes. So, uh, you know, if it's something, if it's another entity that's 
conducting this fundraising like the PTA, for example, then, then yeah, there may be some tax implications, but if it's the school itself, no. Okay, and the question, and the question that, that I wanted to put is, all right, what's, what's so different between K-12 public schools and the university? They're institutions well, of higher learning. They're, they're state agencies. So if, if the department's saying that, that the schools are all exempt from tax, why is the, why is the uh, university exposed to any kind of tax at all? Right. As you just said, there's no difference. They're both government agencies. Is, 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 could there be any legitimate distinction? I don't think so. But they, but they still got the university scared, and and the university came in with a uh, with a veto recommendation, uh, as well as the tax department, and that that led to uh, mm -hmm. Senate Bill thirty two one being placed on the intent to veto list, and then and then now, as we found out just a couple of days ago, um, it it did get vetoed. How do you know this was the reason it got placed on the veto list and was vetoed? I mean, is this stated in the veto list? No, no, I, I had some inside information. Okay, well, it seems to me that, um, you know, I, I would like to know that too. I would like to know if the governor um, and the, the people who are trying to influence him are wrong about their interpretation and a, a state agency is wrong about their interpretation of the existing state law. Um, do you think the veto list ought to give his reasons or give, uh, express who is asking? No, I mean, um, the, the current veto message and the intent to veto recommendation, uh, you know, it just said oh, that, that the governor was concerned about um, unintended consequences. That's pretty vague. And then uh, the actual veto message kind of said, well, and it's going to cost a lot. It's going to cost uh, basically three and a half million dollars a year in revenues. Is that, is that a legitimate reason to veto this bill that would forgive um, uh, nonprofits a certain amount of gross excise tax? Well, that's debatable. Um, you know, certainly um, anytime you enact a credit or incentive, it's going to have a revenue cost. So some have more revenue costs than others. Anytime you act, enact an exemption, it has a revenue cost. Let's go back to the bill itself. I mean, we're a nonprofit. You're a nonprofit. We care about these things because we know how hard it is, especially in this environment, um, to raise funds. Uh, I include COVID. I include you know the economy in general and. I include the, those those things that are undermining our society these days. Um, it's hard to raise funds, and so um, so nonprofits do a lot of work that the government would otherwise have to do itself, or that the government cannot do itself and can only be done by nonprofits. I mean, the government, for example, is not going to have a tax foundation like yours, and I'm not sure the government would ever have. Uh, you know, organization like Think Tech, a media organization. So these 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 organizations and lots of other nonprofits, including social safety net nonprofits, perform valuable services in our community. We need to keep them alive. We need to incentivize contributions. Therefore, it seems to me that this bill was a good idea, three and a half million dollar um, you know, reduction in, in collections or not. Um, and the, you know, it's you know, tax is all about priorities, right? You want to prioritize a, a public policy point on this, and maybe not on that. Um, and so you you can't just make a flat tax. You you have to think about what the state, as a matter of public policy, wants to do. And clearly, what it should be wanting to do is incentivize nonprofits who do important work in our community. Well, I mean, that's, that's the reason why uh, nonprofits get a tax exemption in the first place. Uh, but, the, but the problem over the years has been uh, that, you know, most of the people who are um, shanghaied into performing financial work for nonprofit organizations 
uh, and I say Shanghai because um, most most of them just don't do that voluntarily. They they need to be asked. Uh, a lot of them come from backgrounds where they know what the federal tax law says, but they have no idea what GE law says for nonprofits. I mean, it's it's kind of you know. Uh, Unrelated business income is a concept that's taught in school. Okay, you learn it in accounting school, you learn it in law school, if you take tax classes, you know stuff like that. But GE, uh, not a chance. Okay, I mean that that is something that is kind of too specific. Uh, when you're when you're in Hawaii, you either need to find out about it, you know, through your own research, um, or you find out about about it the hard way, defending an audit. <laughs> Well, GE is, um, you know, is draconian. I mean, George Freitas uh, spent his career at the tax office trying to expand the, the gross excise tax into everything, and he succeeded. It's, it's plenary. It covers everything you can think of. There are really no significant exemptions. It's all over the, all over the, the economy. Um, and other states uh, which have, you know, similar taxes designated Sales taxes have all kinds of exemptions and uh, deductions, and uh, you know, try to make it um, more just, if you will. Our gross excise tax is not just, and it's regressive. And uh, come to find that in the, you know the rules of application are different um, for the gross excise tax as they would be for the federal uh, unrelated business income standard. It's troubling, and there should be reform, don't you think? This was a reform, right? Yeah, it was an attempted reform. But it failed. But it failed. So my question to you is, uh, is this going to come back? Uh, will there be, should there be other reforms in the gross excise tax? Should there be exemptions? You know, like we talked about for years for, for drugs and the like. Um, that actually affect um, the disadvantaged people, the lower economic groups lower income groups. Um, so it's not so regressive. We need the reform, but um, is there an appetite for reform? It doesn't sound like it. Uh, no, no, well, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think one of the problems is uh, that, that the, the way our GET works, uh, it's so different from how it works in, any, in every other state uh, that people get confused and uh, you know, they leave themselves wide open for the Department of Tax to come and get and do a gotcha. Okay. Which is exactly what happens. That's that's absolutely right. And, and so I, I think there should be, you know, greater efforts to, you know, achieve a greater understanding with the public about what this what this sucker does, how it acts. And uh that that way, I think at least it'll be uh, more fair. In that, you know, with people with with people knowing, you know, how how it works and uh, and 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 guessing in the appropriate circumstances would be right most of the time. Then, you know, you you have you know less of a chance for the the gotcha moments and the. And and the instances where the where the where the tax could get really unfair. Now, um, I do think uh, that that GET is more fair than a sales tax. In that, if you want to spread the 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 cost of doing business, uh, um, you have all the businesses participate, not just the the retail stores who sell tangible personal property. Why do you why do you let one sector or another uh, skate as 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 most as as is the case in most states? Most states completely exempt the service sector. But um, you're right. Or, there's no there's no good distinction for that. Yeah, it's it's retail revenue whether you're selling widgets or services. Yep. Yeah. So so in that in that event um, or in in that manner, I, I think the GET is like perversely more fair. It's regressive, yes, but that's but that's one reason why we can keep it at like four percent or four and a half percent, as opposed to like nine percent in a state like California. 
Let me just uh, uh, ask uh, about that half percent. Um, you know, back in the lingual days, somehow that that got adopted. Point, what is it? Seven one two additional percent on gross excise. So in the old days, when things were simpler, you paid four percent. Um, yeah, it was four point one six seven. One, yeah, to cover the the cover the tax on the tax. Tax on the tax. I love when they have tax on the tax. Um, but now it's not that anymore. It's a four point oh seven one two, um, and and that I thought that was kind of like for a period of time, not forever. Can you can you give us a little thumbnail about what happened there and why it's still in place? Because of rail. I mean the the the, the half percent surcharge uh, was uh, was a means to get you know more money to. The Honolulu Rail Project, um, and that that happened, I think, in what two thousand and six, two thousand and seven, mm -hmm. and it's kind of been there ever since. I mean, a lot of things, you know, start off as a, a good idea with a, you know, with a temporary duration, but it gets extended and extended and extended. Like, you know, in the tra the transient accommodations tax was originally enacted at five percent. To build a convention center. Well, now our convention center is built, and our, our transit accommodations tax is at ten point two five percent, plus three percent more for for the county surcharges on it. So, I mean, it, things just have a, a way of spiraling out of control, and, and I think that that's what happened to the the half percent when it when it first got adopted. The other the other counties were saying, well. You know we should have this right too, and 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 the constitution I think I think does say that. Uh, initially, most of the counties wanted you know hands off, and and they they, they didn't think that um, uh, adopting you know a half percent in their in their respective counties would do them any good. But they they kind of gotten to the realization that they got had to do that to to stay alive economically, and so they did. Mm -hmm. Why, why, if the county needed the money, why didn't they just raise the um, real property tax? That's a very good question. But it seems that property tax is, you know, visible and associated with the counties. So um, if they did that, you know, the, the uh, voters would know who to boot. With, with the GE tax, there's a, there's a little bit more confusion and a, a little bit a little bit more, I think, uh, deniability. Yeah, if you can <clears throat> slip it by the taxpayer, um, then then it's a great source of additional funds, I guess. And and that's what it is. It's confusion, as you said. Um, the other thing is that you know, like in the case of Act Two Twenty One and many other incentive provisions, the legislature has adopted. Um, there were. And there are specific sunset dates, but there's no sunset date on that half percent, is there? Well, there is. When is it? Uh, I think it's now. It's up to I think twenty twenty thirty three. <laughs> That's eleven years from now, Tom. <laughs> yeah, it was supposed to be. I think this year or next year, but but it got extended a few times. Mm, okay. So the Tax Foundation of Hawaii looks at all these things. Um, and uh, I mean, you've, you're talking about things that really do need to be rationalized and reformed. Um, uh, so you're not just interested in reducing taxes, or for that matter, in making sure that the, you know, the, the, the spending of the money is, is legitimate and fair and rational and all that. You're interested in looking at the whole system then. Give me, give me your mission on that. Um, our, our, our mission is to uh, help people create a, a rational and fair tax system. And we have, you know, different criteria on our website that we use to evaluate this, like the, pr the proportionality of BERT and the re regressivity, for example, transparency. Are you able to, to do that? Because you don't actually submit bills um, that I know of. Um, who who is submitting bills that that seek reform? You know, everybody is self interested, 
And there's nobody who comes by and says, oh, this is really wrong. This is unfair. This is disproportionate. Um, this is regressive. We, we can't do this. Uh, but what what um, interest group, what organization uh, submits bills to do that? It's a very good question. I don't think there is one. So hmm. that's, uh, and, and um, yeah, I mean, you have incentive proposals being put forth by lawmakers. You have increased proposals being put forth by lawmakers. You have, you know, once in a while, some technical reform proposals being, you know, put up by the department, but it's usually um, ways to spread the pain rather than, you know, uh, relieve people of it. You know, to circle back to our <clears throat> original discussion, Tom, um, you know, the, the general rule is, uh, well, the two general rules is no man, no man or woman's uh, life and property is safe while the legislature is in session. But that's kind of a joke. Um, we do need them to consider public policy and to um, adopt reasonable, helpful, and community beneficial legislation. The other rule is the taxes never go down. They go up, but they never, ever go down. And yet, here we are on talking tax with Tom, and we find this bill, 3201, which effectively does, it does reduce and reform the gross excise as, as it uh, applies to nonprofits, which, as we have discussed, is a, is a valuable statement of priority and public policy. And yet this bill fails. Where do you put that, you know, in, in the, the general rule that taxes never go down? This one would have reduced tax, at least on some taxpayers, ostensible taxpayers, nonprofit taxpayers, but it was, it was vetoed. Where are we on this? Where are we on reform and rational inquiry into our tax system? Well, I don't know if we have any, you know, I mean, um, uh, we, we have tax provisions that are supposed to be, you know, reviewed. We have reports coming out. We have um, our uh, elected politicians you know, looking at this stuff uh, with at least some degree of understanding. Uh, they, they probably should uh, um, devote a little bit more time to understanding this this stuff more because that that's really what 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 helps feed the engine. Um, of course, the and, engine the engine is the financial engine. It's the fiscal engine that you and I talk about. The ability to pay bills and all that. But I think uh, you know if you take a look at it over the last twenty years. What you don't see is an improvement of the engine by diversifying the economy, um, by incentivizing new businesses and all that. We haven't really spent time or legislative effort doing that. And the other thing, you know, and it's all around, you know, kids leaving the brain drain, which is ultimately going to make us a backwater uh, sooner than later, is, is this. It's public confidence. If I give you a reform bill and I say, we are going to make this rational. We are going to reform parts of it which we don't consider fair uh, or appropriate to raise money. We're going to have a comprehensive view of our tax system. What, what I do is I engender public confidence. The veto of this bill 3201, at least to me, does not engender public confidence. Where are we, where are we going on public confidence, Tom? Yeah, I, that's that's a very good point, Jay. Um, this bill obviously got scuttled in backroom dealings after the legislature had had finished, after the uh, chance to submit public input had come and gone. Uh, we need to do better. Yeah, we need to do better. And and the remarkable thing, as you discussed early on in the show, is that the basis on which the bill was scuttled was wrong. It was a mistake. It was a mistake as to the interpretation of the existing law. So there you have it. What an interesting discussion. What an interesting scenario. Thank you very much, Tom. Tom Yamachika, 
president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, here on Talking Tax with Tom. Thanks so much. Aloha, Jay. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.